Good afternoon, class, and welcome to our chapter 10 on families. And it is a chapter that shares with us sociological perspectives and theories on how to think about families, a concept that has changed so much over time that perspectives really vary. And this is a very interesting chapter to discover and to discuss um, in our live class. So I welcome you back from our uh, reading break, um, also with um, a kind of um, excitement that uh, the midterm is behind you. And um, uh, there are uh, a number of tips that I will share with you to help you prepare for the second half of the term uh, with an eye towards the exam. So, um, the 10th chapter, as I said, um, helps us to analyze and understand the role of families in society. And we'll look at perspectives, uh, portrayals, um, and th you know, theoretical approaches to what a family um, as a social unit is. We will also think about uh, the significance of age groups and the kind of social patterns that uh, emerge um, from uh, with different family organizations or uh, social patterns near the home, so around the kind of family structure. So the image there you see on the screen um, is of uh, a uh, fictional family from a show called Modern Family. And so the Modern Family um, has a uh, number of features we'll discuss um, portrayed somewhat satirically. It is a comedy show, but I wanted to point to this as an example of what is um, being portrayed as a modern family uh, in comparison to, for example, Married with Children, which is a show that I grew up watching um, that had a very, uh, uh, old-fashioned, I guess you can say, perspective on what families looked like. Uh, they were nuclear families, uh, a married man and woman uh, with um, typically a couple of children living under the same roof. Here you see in the image, um, Phil and his uh, wife have three children, which is the uh, sort of example of a nuclear family. But then here you have a uh, an older, uh, he's uh, the father of, the, of Phil's um, wife, and he remarried a younger um, female, and that's her son, so he's a, a stepfather. And then you have the gay couple who adopted a child, um, and um, Mitch is her um, brother, and Cameron is this larger-than-life, really, um, funny character, but uh, the representation of what uh, uh, two fathers uh, would look like raising a child is what I suppose um, uh, is a modern feature um, on this show. So again, think to other representations of families prior to 21st century that you've seen on television and immediately you'll see a shift uh, in perspective. So. We'll look at definitions of family as a concept and the kinds of changes in families in the 21st century um, caused by uh, further urbanization as a result of industrialization. Here is something I'm introducing now to help you uh, start um, you know, thinking in a way that prepares you for your quizzes and your larger assignments. So here's a sample quiz question. Uh, blank is a violation of a couple's emotional and or sexual exclusivity, also referred to as cheating, adultery, or having an affair. So the answer, I'm sure you probably can clearly uh, guess, uh, even if maybe you haven't read the book yet, um, the answer is infidelity. But this gets complicated when you have examples of um, certain type of blended uh, families where a mother and a father with their children may have an additional relationship, which um, is not exactly polygamous, but it creates a kind of disturbance to this um, idea of exclusivity and something that happens in the 21st century uh, in a way that is, um, I guess one could argue, less controversial than what um, it would have been perceived prior to the 21st century. So what is a family? It's a social unit. 
it's an organization uh, of uh, people in a unit and it has its uh, set of social behaviors and relations and um, it, essentially it's how we imagine what families do uh, and how and what they do under the same roof typically household uh, roof if it's uh, the immediate family and there's also of course extended families so we'll talk about these terms so um, families are uh, a very old uh, ancient social institution and the norms around families uh, lasted for a long time uh, what happened after industrialization is something that is quite recent and so this is important to um, understand so uh, increasingly norms around what a family is uh, is open to interpretation and varying uh, practices around not marrying um, the uh, huge rate of divorce um, and many many other um, practices that weren't as uh, 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 standard um, are changing our perspectives on the family. So here's uh, another set of questions that may give you a sense of what you might be asked on, let's say, the final exam about this unit. Uh, in what way, uh, in what ways have new technologies changed the supervisory roles that parents perform? How do technologies influence parents' behavior? Would be another way to ask that. Uh, what might be unique challenges that parents face in supervising their children's online activities? So how does technology um, perhaps increase the um, precarious uh, status of parents as authority? Um, how has technology affected your relationship with your parents? Um, there are parents, for example, who will be on social media, and I know of um, people who find this disturbing that their mom or dad or grandpa or grandma are on um, Facebook or Instagram uh, following them, etc. So um, what, you know, what other examples can you think of in your own life? So from the conflict theory perspective, um, uh, we think about the historical uh, approaches to families as units and thinking about uh, the political and economic reasons behind families as constructs. Uh, I mentioned in previous lectures, the practice of marriage and in the very first week, uh, the film subservience that we watched demonstrates a kind of uh, ritual around um, uh, the, the marrying practice uh, among the bourgeoisie, uh, where it is essentially a uh, power relationship as well. It is a form of passing down money or creating, um, uh, you know, a uh, lineage where, you know, you are part of the privileged clan and this continues. Um, so uh, conflict theory very much is interested in how industrialization has changed um, families as units because prior to industrialization, families on farms, for example, would be self-sustaining. They would be able to produce everything they need to eat and even the clothings um, and much of the uh, basic needs and necessities of the family. Once uh, industrialization happened and urban centers emerged and a lot of people started moving to these centers, um, families became increasingly dependent on uh, sources of income outside of the farm, outside of the household. If we think from a functionalist perspective, um, we think of a family as a socializing unit and a kind of central institution which helps people to learn how to behave in a society. So functionalists very much consider the family to be an agent, a primary agent of socialization. And we talked about this in our unit on socialization. Um, symbolic interactionism, uh, our third framework, tries to consider how family members interact with one another and the ways in which, for example, uh, based on different social expectations, uh, placed upon different family members, how conflicts are resolved. For example, um, perhaps in a, in a patriarchal society, it still holds true that in many households, 
uh, the father's final word is what uh, makes the decision for the, uh, the entire unit of the family. Maybe not so much in uh, what we now would call a more progressive, um, uh, less patriarchal um, worldview in a family where uh, females have grown up to uh, imbibe the messages of feminist thinkers. So if you think about um, family mythologies, for example, um, I would say that um, uh, the, uh, well, the personal example in the Russian culture, uh, there's a myth that uh, women are a kind of a neck for the head of the household. So a male is the head and the female is the neck. So you can imagine where the neck turns is where the head goes. Um, and this is, I would say, um, to some extent, um, a witty expression. It's an idiomatic kind of thing that people say in Russia, but I would say not only is it a, a kind of harmful sexist overgeneralization, but also uh, I would argue um, it has bitter irony for the continual gender discrimination in the culture where women still earn less money or have to both work and do all the housework um, and so on. And we'll talk about housework uh, in this unit as well. And then finally, symbolic interactionism. Uh, you want to think about the way that uh, a family has certain ideologies and how um, the simple example of family values, how uh, also mythology could be created based on this within a family unit, but it relies on a larger network of social institutions. So for example, um, uh, from our book, uh, how uh, right-wing conservative um, religious um, institutions will uh, influence families to believe, for example, in pro-life as opposed to pro-choice view on abortion, meaning that uh, you may grow up in a family that um, buys into this kind of ideology um, uh, of, um, a, a religiously influenced um, perspective that uh, abortion is never correct, you know, and I've seen here in, in uh, the GTA uh, protests, uh, groups, religious often groups, standing with signs, and these are, you know, not just parents, but their children who are being socialized to say, um, to quite uh, openly um, protest uh, abortion clinics, right, and this is something that um, uh, symbolic interactionism would look at to suggest that, you know, the kinds of values that these children imbibe are very much impacted by the ideologies which uh, uh, have impact on their uh, parents. So finally, the feminist theory um, uh, tries to, again, link the kinds of perspectives on gender construction that we reviewed in our uh, unit on gender um, and sexuality and uh, try to understand social reproduction, key term, um, of how social economic and also political ideological forces um, structure um, uh, certain inequalities uh, or ingrain even certain inequalities into the practices of the family. Um, so despite um, a certain amount of uh, liberation, you can say, for uh, uh, the female uh, half of the population, um, despite the fact that pretty much all women, at least in the Western world, um, go to school and are allowed to vote and to hold jobs, there is still a social reproduction of inequalities that get reproduced within the household where, um, I mean, I grew up with a father who believed that he should never do the dishes because it's a woman's job. Um, so, you know, that's a small and perhaps uh, a more trivial example. And yet it speaks to the kind of social reproduction of ideals that um, happens uh, very much to this day. 
So uh, within the feminist theory, a key term, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, is patriarchy, a system where men predominate in social uh, uh, and political roles of leadership. Um, men are seen as um, beacons of moral authority, and uh, so they have more power, they have more control over a number of things. And um, uh, the other side of this is that uh, women are seen as uh, uh, caregivers who are not necessarily worthy of uh, compensation, monetary compensation, that uh, being a mom, being um, a house uh, uh, holder, you know, someone who is, um, you know, participating in so much to keep the family in good health and um, uh, alive, uh, that this is not um, seen as worthy uh, um, of a labor as what the males do in the household. So again, there are many different terms that we can look at to try to define what exactly a family unit is. And you can say, well, it's a kin group because people are related by blood, but also by marriage, of course. Um, I mentioned the term nuclear family, and uh, typically that suggests mom, dad, and children living under the same roof. A census family is a more uh, a recent term, which uh, designates spouses, not necessarily of the opposite, sex but same-sex marriage is included in this or you can even be cohabitating having not been married officially over a year um, and in Canada um, it is considered uh, to be a uh, legally um, a valid uh, family unit that you can start doing taxes together you can um, uh, act as a family unit, even without the marriage license. So this would be an example of one of the changes to the family unit in the 21st century. And there are, of course, many others. So uh, the family is no longer exclusively for opposite sex marriage only, and um, not only uh, biological children count as children within a family, right? So you can have um, single parent families, which has been the case for centuries um, as it is uh, often, um, well, um, we'll talk about health um, next week, but uh, mortality at, um, during uh, childbirth, uh, the, ch the process of childbirth uh, was a much, much um, higher risk uh, prior to modern medicine. So many a woman had died trying to give birth. Um, you have, of course, step families, which are often a direct result of divorce, which is not as condemned in modern society as uh, it used to be. Although there are lots of exceptions to that, um, often religiously motivated motivated ideologies that say that um, marriage is a ceremony done through God, therefore you can never undo it. So this still exists very much. Um, you have families, as I said, with adoptive children and not necessarily because of a divorce, but because uh, a woman, for example, who cannot conceive um, uh, may uh, choose to adopt a child even alone without a, a partner, a spouse. And these are all considered family units. You have grandchildren. And uh, in my experience, grandparents were a much, much more robust, much more uh, larger kind of part of uh, upbringing in the kind of family unit that I grew up in. Um, and uh, in the Russian community, you still see, even in Canada, some grandparents participating hugely in their grandchildren's lives, while I would say that um, there is uh, a kind of modern drift of grandparents um, not being as involved um, at the same time as uh, some of the uh, families follow the more traditional path. So for example, it used to be that daycares weren't as central to 
uh, the bringing up of the youngest uh, members of the family because the grandparents would help. I was watched by my grandmother, my paternal grandmother for the first um, five years of my life before I ever set foot in a uh, kindergarten. Um, and then, uh, you know, with my kids, uh, uh, this was not the case at all. And um, uh, we have grandparents who live in this uh, city, but they have jobs or they are retired and have um, other responsibilities. And therefore, you know, we, uh, we rely on other social institutions in order to um, help bring up our children. So daycares and, and schools. Um, nieces and nephews and, and, you know, the extended family structure. Uh, again, I think this used to be much more robust in farm life, you know, where you had uh, larger families living together and all working on the farm, whereas today you may have nieces and nephews that you almost never see. Um, foster children and uh, children, you know, uh, being brought up uh, again outside of what was considered traditionally, um, you know, the family unit, biological children, etc. And gay and lesbian families, um, this does not conclude the list um, of the different um, permutations of family structure. But as we think about all this, we want to think about the challenges to the nuclear family unit um, in a single dwelling and uh, how in some cultures, because Canada is such a multicultural um, country, that there are probably examples you know of, of uh, a kind of um, extended family structure where, um, for example, uh, due to immigration and the kind of desire to construct a new life in Canada, extended family may live together in order to support each other. And I already mentioned common law couples that if you're not married, but you live together, uh, after a year of cohabitation, you are technically considered a family. Uh, so same-sex couples, uh, uh, again, as a unit, is, is still controversial. It's, I think, uh, naive to say that everybody accepts this. And it really also, I think, speaks highly of Canada that it is the law to accept same-sex couples, whereas in Russia, for example, there are increasingly horrible homophobic laws that um, attempt to um, repress um, same-sex couples. So we enjoy a lot more freedom in that sense in Canada compared to many countries in the world, even our neighbors down south, um, uh, where there are states that do not want to legalize um, same-sex marriage, etc. or even if in a state there is same-sex marriage, there are all kinds of legal um, uh, difficulties that are designed to uh, oppress um, uh, same-sex uh, couples. And um, the single parent family um, construct, again, it's, it's not as stigmatized as it used to be, um, but certainly there are uh, financial challenges that our society does not always address with single parent families. And that's also something that we can discuss um, in our meeting. So um, families after industrialization got smaller. Um, I just last week met a family um, who live on a farm about uh, an hour and a half away from uh, where I live up north and uh, they have seven children and all the children work on this farm uh, which uh, uh, houses not only um, three uh, different families uh, but also uh, a number of uh, livestock and like something like 40 horses um, so when you have 40 horses you need a bigger family to manage those horses that's quite obvious um, um, and these children are all homeschooled. And it just gave me, again, that kind of um, excellent sociological imagination expansion uh, to say, you know, even in 2020, uh, in a very, very relatively modernized um, 
province like Ontario in Canada, we have families living um, uh, more like they used to live 100 years ago. Now, having said that, these families have uh, just as advanced technology as the rest of us do. Um, they have a smart car, they have laptops, they have technology, they have smartphones, right? Um, and they certainly have much better technologies for keeping their animals, you know, and so on and so forth. But the family unit itself is so different. You know, there are very few families in the city that have seven children um, and also live with their in-laws and um, uh, parents, like both sides, parents, etc. So industrialization shrunk the size of the family um, and uh, also impacted the way family members behave and what's expected of them, partly uh, uh, as a result of higher levels of education, which um, is accessible to more and more people, um, and also better access to birth control. Um, that, you know, even my paternal grandma had, uh, uh, sorry, she had only one child after World War II, but she was part of a family of five and um, as the eldest was very much responsible for her four younger siblings because her dad died in World War II. Um, so uh, with the invention of birth control methods um, and because of education, she, for example, uh, became a photographer and was a professional photographer for uh, over 40 years of her life um, um, until I was born. And then she basically soon retired and took care of me. Um, but this gives you an example of the very big difference between early 20th century, you know, minimal birth control, especially in Russia, um, and uh, lack of education for women. And just 50 years later, the woman uh, was able to choose much more uh, the path in life. And uh, uh, the mobility, you know, not growing up exactly where you were born and staying there for the rest of your life, but choosing to move, you know, and then, you know, immigrants, my parents decided to even move across the ocean to a very distant um, country. So um, you want to think about industrialization's impact on the family unit and how urbanization has also uh, increased efficiency, increased um, uh, sort of technologically induced um, efficiencies and practices that were not part of the family uh, structure before. Um, so this chart kind of summarizes for you new modes of uh, family. Um, and um, the, uh, again, the communal family as the new mode of family. Um, I don't have personal examples from my own life, but um, I uh, do know of examples of uh, a married couple with uh, children uh, deciding to cohabit with another person and to, to make it, you know, uh, both, both an intimate uh, relationship and a relationship where the children accept that they now have three parents and that this is not, um, thankfully, in, in Canada stigmatized. Right, um, because stigmatizing anyone is is um, an oppressive practice. Um, but certainly, it is a new mode, a more modern mode of perceiving what a family may look like. So, why is this important? Well, again, we have to think about the uh, impact on domestic work. Who does? You know, today there are all kinds of articles you can read about the fact that men are really trying to share the load in the household. Um, work, uh, the kinds of chores, uh, chores that were um, typically seen as only women's work. Um, but I recently read an article that's suggesting that uh, during the pandemic, uh, women are feeling more and more exhaustion from the added responsibilities um, uh, as a result of uh, the quarantine and having the children, for example, not go to school from March until June. And so the additional responsibilities of cooking extra meals and cleaning up more and so on and so forth. So again, lots to think about. And um, the concept of a home, you know, as separate and different from work, that just went out the window as a result of the pandemic. 
you know, as I sit here and teach from home and then my children come into the home and I multitask and I mark as I'm feeding them and so on. The separation is similarly with my husband who has uh, an office job um, uh, as a counselor, basically. He also feels the pressure of not being able to step away from, from the job, even at home. Um, and that this is creating new um, psychological strain uh, and that we have to be very mindful of the impact on our mental health. Now, if we think about some of the labor saving technologies, um, one of my uh, favorite examples, and I'll give you the, um, the talk with Michael Pollan as an optional additional resource that you can watch. He's quite entertaining, I think, so you might enjoy this. But Michael Pollan is an author, a journalist who's written a number of really compelling books looking at the production of food in uh, post-World War II society, post-industrial society. And um, his latest books, book is called Cooked, and he looks at the kind of labor-saving technologies or industries that developed since World War II. And um, I love the example from the 1970s of KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, um, marketing on billboards uh, their chicken, their fast food product as woman's liberation that the women don't have to cook, they could just go purchase some KFC. Um, and, you know, you can add a whole list of um, uh, technologies that have been marketed this way from microwaves to other kitchen gadgets to obviously uh, automated um, cleaning devices. Uh, the iRobot is a very, very popular, um, uh, you know, both status symbol, but also gadget that you can buy for your household these days. And um, this is all part of, you know, sort of trying to reduce the home labor. Um, but um, this, again, essentially, I think, pushes us to think about what the household as a, as a place, um, in contrast to the workplace, means to us as uh, members of society. So, you know, if we look at uh, some statistics, um, as our book suggests, women continue to do more housework than men. And that um, uh, in heterosexual couples, at least, there is sti still an imbalance. Um, uh, and again, this is a very feminist perspective, right, to say, look, men still make more money in the workplace and they do less work at home. How is this fair? Um, so we can get also into a discussion of uh, childbearing and child rearing and the kind of maternal leave, paternal leave benefits that are or are not available um, uh, in Canada. Um, you can look at the statistics yourself. I really strongly suggest that when you read the book, you pick out and highlight some examples for yourself that you remember in order to discuss them either in your uh, assignments or on the final exam. Um, so when we think about families as units that also ensure uh, promotion of good health, uh, we want to think about the way you know you think of parents as roles or role models that try to offer emotional support, not just physical, you know, they fed you, they gave you clothes, but emotional support, boosting your spirits and encouraging you not to give up, um, to participate in school, to participate in sports or other extracurricular activities. So uh, family caregivers, uh, male or female, um, are expected to provide some uh, emotional support, but also practical, uh, you know, kind of life skills of all kinds. And um, of course, uh, this directly links to um, in the family unit, you know, uh, how does illness or disability impact the possibility of giving care, right? Um, if you have a parent with a severe disability, for example, how does that impact the overall functioning of the family? Um, so typically, traditionally, primary caregivers were women, wives and mothers and daughters and grandmothers. 
Um, but I would say that increasingly um, males are taking on uh, caregiving roles and um, at least within my generation, I see examples of that of my friends uh, where the husband uh, or another male figure in the household um, actively volunteers to change diapers or you know, cook or do these traditionally female um, roles. Another point about uh, health, and we'll again have a whole unit next week on that, um, that with the rise of the internet as a source of useful information, people may have better um, access to um, basic understanding of health uh, concerns or health practices, etc. But a huge risk I want to emphasize is WebMD. <laughs> or any of those websites that um, give you general health advice, which could be filled with either misinformation or people misread this information. And this could be quite dangerous to self-diagnosis and self-treatment in particular. So um, we have to keep that very much in mind. And again, to think back to our unit on socialization, I would say that um, uh, families are as primary uh, agents of socialization, they are your peer group. They are your framing of uh, the worldview through either religion or other uh, cultural uh, practices and uh, early uh, educators as well, right? Um, I think most of us had our parents try to teach us how to read the alphabet, you know, and read with us books and draw with us and other activities as well. Um, so uh, now with the uh, highly digital, um, digitized, digitally influenced world, uh, since um, electronic media uh, became available even as something that children play with, that has a huge impact on the way we socialize children. So even a hundred years ago, parents were already wondering um, what kind of impact uh, the um, uh, camera, the telephone would have on um, the way in which a family would function. And now with the internet since the late 20th century, um, there is quite a bit of concern about what the generation Z is experiencing as part of their socialization. Right? So for example, before the internet, you know, there was, um, uh, always a concern about the impact of television as a, a kind of um, agent of socialization, watching certain kinds of uh, cartoons. Uh, if you watch old cartoons, for example, there were no restrictions on um, making characters depict uh, activities we generally don't approve of anymore, like smoking. I grew up watching a Russian cartoon where the wolf uh, that chased the bunny, pretty much Tom and Jerry style, but it was a wolf with a bunny. The wolf would smoke, you know, and um, and that this is um, what we need to think about actively. And I think it's really quite um, interesting uh, to think about the uh, different media um, uh, influences on our children, on the way we grew up as children and what's happening uh, today. So the internet, um, I guess uh, you can see as interactive television. Um, and uh, you know, you've mentioned in our live sessions, the um, positive impact of things like Netflix, um, uh, you know, some of these kind of customizable experience of the internet. But I also have to wonder about what um, kinds of um, instances of uh, mind shaping happen through not only social media, but um, uh, certain marketed uh, products like video games and uh, uh, other forms of entertainment on um, children, because statistics show us that um, you know uh, a lot of um, people in Canada under sorry age eighteen and over um, are highly savvy with all these different forms of media that are available on the internet. Um, and I wonder how many children, for example, there's this um, uh, kind of uh, 
trend um, that I've witnessed over the last maybe five years on, on YouTube that uh, children have their YouTube channels too now. Parents help them um, create uh, marketable kind of channels that even generate money. You know, like this is unprecedented and very interesting to think about. And then finally, family and work. So we talked about, you know, the sort of social inequalities, uh, gender inequalities that can be structured within the family. But these days, especially with the pandemic, because remember this book was written just shortly before the pandemic, not shortly, uh, over a year uh, and a half prior to, but um, telecommuting, um, working from home instead of going to an actual workplace is something that is becoming an increasing um, necessity now because of the pandemic. But I really wonder what will happen uh, even after the coronavirus is under control, maybe vaccinations will become available and commonplace. Um, I have a neighbor who already was working from home even prior to COVID-19, and she has two little children uh, of uh, barely uh, school age and uh, under school age. And um, I see her multitasking both as a, an accountant and a um, uh, mom who takes one of, care of one of the children at home while the other goes to school. So this is, again, something to think about. Um, and uh, we also want to think about the intrusion of all this technology into the household, into the kinds of um, uh, different routines that this creates. For example, parents looking at their screens as they're feeding dinner to their children. You know, I mean, I've marked um, your work and other students' work while um, trying to help my son do his homework or help my daughter eat her soup. And that this is, on the one hand, the reality that we face, on the other hand, something that maybe we should really strongly think about um, as a uh, difficulty that's emerging in our family unit. So uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts um, uh, this week on the kinds of uh, challenges that families face in 21st century Canada, how technologies may expand and enrich family life to some extent, and how uh, the uniformity of what a family as a unit looks like has really been challenged in the 21st century. So thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to our live class. Take care.